and welcome to the first Radcliffe Chambers uh, charity webinar of 2021. Uh, my name is Natalie Brett and I'm one of the junior members of Chambers. Uh, you don't need to worry because I'm joined by two more senior and able colleagues this morning. I'm joined by Francesca Quint and Joshua Winfield. Um, our title for this morning is Issues in Charity Law, Administration uh, and Litigation. Uh, the running order will be that Francesca will speak first, Joshua will go second, and then I will speak third. Um, so without keeping you any further, I will hand over to our first speaker and hand you over to Francesca. Good morning. Um, I'm aiming to outline the background to and justification for the Charity Commission's recent recognition that the, the promotion of journalism, which is carried out in the public interest, is both beneficial to the public and capable of being charitable in law. The immediate context is the Cairn Cross Review, which um, is subtitled A Su Sub Sustainable Future for Journalism, and was published in February 2019. This was commissioned by the DCMS, and uh, the time the timing of that was when it was generally accepted that print journal print journalism was on the decline and more and more people were using uh, online uh, platforms to uh, supply news and uh, so forth the review was led by dame francis cancross who is a respected economist academic and journalist and um, among pub other public offices was a former chair of the executive committee of the Institute of Fiscal Studies. She is the daughter of Sir Alexander Cairncross, who in his lifetime was also a prominent economist and an author and advisor to government. Dame Francis is now the chairman of PINF. PINF is the Public Interest News Foundation. The Carecross Review recommended, among other things, that the government should adopt a strategy for media literacy so that people generally would be familiar with and able to, to criticise and deal with um, the media as a method, method of providing news, etc. And also that promoting journalism in the public interest should be made charitable in law. And it was envisaged that legislation might be needed for that purpose, in addition to the Charities Act 2011. It also recommended the establishment of an official public interest news institute, a regulator for serious news reporting and journalism. And it favored uh, um, innovation and a fresh approach to the dissemination of news. There were consistent recommendations which came from the Independent Publishers Task Force and uh, appeared in the House of Lords report, Breaking News, question mark, the future of UK journalism, which was actually dated in November 2020. So that was some time after a PINF or PIN, the Public Interest News Foundation was registered. PINF was established as a charitable company and registered as a charity in November 2019. It's supported by Impress, the modest independent news press regulator established in, in 2016 and not itself a charity, which publishes standards and a guidance code. And it is also supported by the Joseph Ryan Roundtree Reform Trust, also not a charity, and therefore free to, to innovate without constraints that charitable status imposes. Now, the objects of PINF um, are as follows. One, to promote public understanding and knowledge of the principles and practice of investigating reporting and disseminating public interest news, including relevant law, ethics, codes of conduct, and practical aspects of, re of related activities. That's the first object. The second object is to promote citizenship and civic responsibility. 
and encourage and facilitate informed participation and engagement by members of the public in their communities, including by supporting the provision of public interest news by exclusively charitable means. And the third object is to promote high standards of ethical conduct and best practice in journalism and the editing and the publication of news in the print and other media for the benefit of the general public, having regard to the need to act within the law and to protect both the privacy of individuals and freedom of expression. These objects can be decided, divided into, first of all, an educational object, which is to educate the public about the kind of journalism which provides news in a responsible way to the, in the public interest. Um, in other words, providing accurate and relevant information about matters of proper, proper concern to the public. Secondly, a community strengthening object, promoting and promoting good citizenship by involving members of the public in matters of public significance in their own communities. And those communities could be geographical, occupational, academic or other types of community. And thirdly, a professional object promoting high standards and best practice in the professions of journalism, news editing and news publishing. In carrying out the objects, PINR is required, like the Independent Press Regulation Trust, or IPRT, to recognise the need both to protect individual privacy and generally to encourage freedom of expression, an essential but sometimes a difficult balancing act. It also deals with all types of journalism, print, broadcast and online. This development in charitable status ultimately derives from the, the controversies over the news of the world and attempts to regulate the press following the Leveson report. You may remember there was an awful lot of uh, um, kerfuffle about various things the news of the world had done, uh, which actually led to its demise. And the Leveson report uh, recommended a proper regulation of the press by an independent regulator. At the time, there was only a press uh, uh, regulator, which was um, actually set up by the press themselves. These de uh, developments were followed by the Charity Tribunal's decision, which was actually contrary to the approach of the Charity Commission at the time, that IPRT the Independent Press Regulation Trust, which is also linked with Impress, should be registered as a charity. It, has, it is to be hoped that with cha changes in culture and personnel at the Charity Commission, some of the previously hostile attitudes will disappear as the need for and benefits of PINR are increasingly accepted by the public and the media. Recent signs of growing responsibility among providers of social media platforms, i.e. what we should now regard as social media publishers, are encouraging. Now, I'm, I'm suggesting that the, um, the decision of the Commission marks a turning point, not only for the Commission itself, but also in the general direct de development of what is regarded as charitable in relation to um, the press and journalism, which previously have had a rather patchy recognition by the Commission. And I, I think this is a, a worthy um, decision to record. I'm happy to take questions. I might have a question, Francesca, even though we said questions at the end. Um, isn't PA, PINR just set up to benefit commercial organisations? Well, that is one of the problems which was recognised uh, when, when uh, the, the um, Cairncross review was compiled, that if you, if you try to improve um, news reporting in the public interest, you are helping the newspapers or the other 
um, organizations that actually provide the news and you are helping them to do their job better. But on the other hand, um, sometimes you need to have uh, an independent stake in the development of uh, commercial activities in order for that for that for those activities to achieve something which is itself charitable or, or in the public interest in itself and left to, left to themselves um, um, social media platforms and other organizations would not necessarily uh, concern themselves about matters to do with ethics and accuracy in reporting we've seen too often that um, there, there are people who are interested in promoting fake news and um, other um, other things which are definitely not in the interest of the public. Um, and also, also um, there are also individuals, and I can I can name one, who have abused their, their position as prominent people to put put out inaccurate information and um, views. Thank you. Have you got any comeback on that, Natalie? Uh, I have. I won't ask you to name the individual that you think you might be able to name. <laughs> I think I think we can all think of it, who that is. <laughs> I have a question, which is, uh, where does the independent press standards organisation fit into this picture? IPSO is the well-known larger uh, press regulator, which has been set up following the Leveson report, but was actually not uh, set up in accordance with the recommendations in the Leveson report, because it's not independent in the sense that it's actually set up by the press. But the press are very difficult to regulate and difficult to lead and in fact um, they like to do things their own way and so that's what they did and they set up ipso but interestingly enough um, the financial times the independent and the guardian have refused to join it i, I don't know whether they've joined impress but they probably have um, so so um ipso uh, one, one hopes will be influenced by uh, um, PINR uh, eventually, and um, one hopes that it will try to try to be as independent as, poss as possible. Um, but it's it provides standards which are accepted by the press uh, uh, in general or by its members, and um, I think that that's a step in the right direction at least. Can I hand over to Josh? Thank you Francesca. Um, I am going to talk about when form affects function. Um, we all know I, uh, I expect that when choosing the form of your charity at the um, registration stage or pre-registration stage, there are a few basic considerations. Um, for example, do the trustees really need the protection of limited liability? Um, does the structure, does the, the operation of the charity need the flexibility of an unincorporated association where the membership has a big role in the, the annual kind of running of the charity? Or does the simplicity and certainty of a trust structure fit the bill? But within, regardless of the structure that's chosen, the course functions and duties of the trustees are essentially the same. I mean, they're there to fulfill the purposes of the charity and act in the best interest of the charity, regardless of whether they're company directors, uh, the committee of an unincorporated association or trustees in the strict sense. But in my experience, the choice of form can have some unintended consequences and I'm going to just look at a, just a couple of a few of the points that might not be at the forefront of, of one's mind 
when one is setting up the charity, but will have consequences later on. Um, I mean, first of all, it's a very hot topic, the, the fiduciary duties of members of charities. It's a hot topic because of the Children Investment Fund uh, Foundation UK case in the Supreme Court, which dealt with members of a company limited by guarantee. An interesting starting point is the CIO structure because that's unique in having a statutory statement of the duty of members and it's in section 220 of the 2011 Charity Act, Charities Act. Um, each member of a CIO must exercise the powers that the member has in that capacity in the way that the member decides in good faith would be most likely to further the purposes of the CIO. Now, it seems to me that the ordinary and natural meaning of those words is that the duty applies to any exercise of, of a power by the member and that the section does create fid a fiduciary duty on the member in exercising the powers that it has in that capacity. Now, I note that Lady Arden in the SIF case, uh, paragraph 95, it's obiter because SIF isn't about a CIO, but she says that section 220 doesn't make clear if the member's duty, its general duty is fiduciary. Well, my view on that point is that the duty as framed in section 220 is consistent with the classic formulation by Lord Justice Millett in Bristol and Western Mothview. Um, it's 1998 Chancery Reports, page one. Page 18a to b is, is the statement. Um, and it's notable at 18c in that report that Lord Justice Millett in endorses the point that a person is not a fiduciary because, sorry, a person is a fiduciary because he or she is subject to fiduciary obligations. It's not the reverse. So on the basis that section 20 gives the members fiduciary obligations, they must be fiduciaries. Also, Lady Arden contrast section 220 with the use of the word, the express use of the word fiduciary in section 178 subsection 2 of the Companies Act 2006. And that's a section on enforcement and it, it's referring back to the, the codified equitable duties of company directors and it says the duties in those sections are accordingly enforceable in the same way as any other fiduciary duty owed to a company by its directors. And in my view, she, uh, Lady Arden is giving too much weight to the use of the word fiduciary in that subsection, which is really a passing mention. And to draw a distinction is really rather artificial. Um, between the duties as actually set out in the in the, the preceding sections of the Companies Act and Section 220. So in my view, the position in respect of CIOs is fairly clear that members are essentially fiduciaries, whatever, whatever power they're exercising. Now, in respect of charitable companies, obviously, we now have a brand new Supreme Court decision. Lady Arden in, in the SIF, de SIF decision at paragraph 78 says that there's a fiduciary relationship between the charitable objects of the company limited by guarantee in question, SIF, and the member in question. There was only one member that was subject to the decision because the other members were conflicted and that the principle applies to all other members of charitable guarantee companies. Lady Arden does include a qualification. She says charitable guarantee companies which contain restrictions which in general 
prevent members uh, receiving profits from the company. Uh, in my view, it's hard to envisage a charitable company that's going to be registered without a restriction to that effect. Um, but Lady Arden goes on at paragraph 101 to disapprove the Court of Appeals adoption of the Section 220 formulation um, as it applies to companies. And she says, the precise circumstances in which the member of a charitable company has fiduciary duties in relation to the charitable purposes and the content of those duties will have to be worked out when they arise. A fiduciary for one obligation is not ipso facto a fiduciary for all. Now, that is consistent with the existing equitable principles notably in Moffew at 16c to 17h. Um, Lord Justice Millett points out that a fiduciary's duty to exercise care and skill is not intrinsically a fiduciary duty. And on that basis, section 220 is an anomaly in apparently not being limited. Um, on, on the face of it, it applies to any power exercised by members. So what I would cautiously uh, say is the import of, of the SIF decision in its narrowest sense is that the duties of members of a company limited by guarantee are treated similarly to those of company directors, certainly of charitable companies, and almost certainly of trustees of charitable trusts, where there is no statutory codification. And then in, in the context of unincorporated associations, that there is no equivalent authority, uh, either statute or a decision of high authority, such as the Supreme Court. But Looking at the SIF decision, the decision in that case is underpinned by authorities that found that directors' duties um, were interpreted and codified by analogy with those of trustees. For example, the French Protestant Hospital case, 1951, Chancery Reports 567. Um, she cited with approval a passage at um, 570 in that judgment. Uh, she has cited it with approval in paragraph 98 of SIF. Um, interestingly, Lady Arden effectively ignored the corporate veil in reaching her decision. At paragraph 50, she says that the fiduciary duties are owed to the objects of the charitable company. And on that basis, there's no principled reason for treating members of an unincorporated association differently from members of a company limited by guarantee as far as fiduciary duties owed to the objects is concerned. So as far as unincorporated associations are concerned, there, there cannot be certainty until there's a binding decision, but certainly it would be very unwise to ignore the impact of the SIF decision um, on decision-making by members of unincorporated associations if one is advising, for example, the committee. Um, I myself have seen many, many disputes involving unincorporated charities. And um, it seems to me that SIF will have an impact on, on many of these cases. Um, turning now to the question of standing to conduct litigation. Those of us who are litigators in this field will be well aware of section 115 of the Charities Act 2011. That sets out in subsection one, the, the persons with standing to take charity proceedings. The charity, i.e. An, an incorporated charity can itself take proceedings. Any of the charity trustees, um, any person interested in the charity, or if it's a local charity, any two or more inhabitants of the area of the charity, and um, but, but not by any other person. Obviously, person interested is the area that has 
is less uh, clear on its face. But I would point out that under section 114, the Charity Commission has similar powers to the Attorney General uh, to take proceedings. Uh, 1156 says that the subsection 1 of 115 doesn't apply to taking of proceedings by the Attorney General or the Charity Commission. Um, the position of the Attorney General is summarised in a Privy Council case, Wallace and the Solicitor General from New Zealand, 1903, appeal cases 173 at 1812. It is the province of the Crown as parents patriae to enforce the execution of charitable trusts. And it has always been recognized as the duty of the law officers of the Crown to intervene for the purpose of protecting charities and affording advice and assistance to the court in the administration of charitable trusts. So the first question is, is section 1151 an enabling or restricting provision? i.e. does it confer rights or powers on persons who would not otherwise have them or limit the exercise of existing rights or powers to persons listed. Now, when researching this, this talk, I found that I really wanted to delve into the, the ancient legislation. And regrettably, I was prevented by lockdown from doing so because I think it, it transpires that the origins of the person interested really is from the late Elizabethan legislation. According to Tudor, uh, paragraph 1602, this concept was really introduced in that legislation to enable the enforcement of charitable trusts, um, where otherwise effectively the trustees would be left to their own devices and in the absence presumably of the Attorney General stepping in, which wouldn't always be practicable. But the question is, how far does it go in conferring standing? And a case that I came across last year was one where the directors of a charitable company in bad faith allegedly purported to transfer assets to a new company without following the proper winding up process in the articles. Now that could certainly be considered a breach of section 17212 of the Companies Act 2006, which as it applies to charities is a duty to achieve the purposes of the company. And according to Hollington on shareholders rights, which is a leading book in this area for companies generally. At paragraph 572, the editors say it's trite law that that's a duty owed to the company, not the shareholders, and that it follows that only a company can bring a claim for breach of, of, of such duties. So there seems to be little doubt that a claim of that nature by the members of a non-charitable company would be a derivative claim and as such would need the permission of the court under part 11 of the 2006 Companies Act. And in the context of proceedings involving a charity that were not charity proceedings, it was held obiter that the, this principle of, of derivative claims would apply to members of a charity. Uh, the case is Abdel Mahmoud and the Egyptian Association in Great Britain Limited. It's 2018 Business Law Reports 1354 in the Court of Appeal. And it was an application by some members to set aside a default judgment against the charity in respect of a loan. And uh, regrettably, the loan related to the costs of charity proceedings involving the charity. And at paragraph 36, uh, Lord Justice Mewey said, um, it's unlikely, the court is unlikely to give permission for derivative claims because the attorney general or the commission can address the issue without the need for a derivative claim. Um, it seems to me that that may be um, rather um, um, utopian view of, of the role that the attorney general and the charity commission take in charity disputes these days, but nevertheless, that's the view of an experienced judge and 
charity practitioner in his time at the bar. Um, he also went on to say that an application for the permission to bring derivat a derivative claim would need section 115 permission. So it seems to me that there's an analogy there with a Bedo application in non-charity proceedings. Now, Lord Justice Newey didn't go on to say how the Attorney General might resolve such an issue extrajudicially. Moreover, if the Attorney General had to intervene in court proceedings, it's still not clear if she can circumvent the Part 11 requirements in respect of derivative claims and stand in the shoes of the company, because this is really an interface between a very distinct statutory uh, code in the Companies Act and the Charities Act provisions, which effectively codify long-standing equitable principles as they apply to charity. A further question is, well, I mean, really what it boils down to is does section 1151 allow persons interested to circumvent what Hollington describes as the trite principle in respect of director's duties and therefore sidestep the issue of a derivative claim in charity proceedings? And Lady Arden in SIF suggests that yes, they should. At paragraph 50 in the SIF judgment, she says again, obiter, because um, we're not talking about charity proceedings in this sense. Um, she talks about the fiduciary duties being owed by the members to the objects and not the company, and says that the attorney general or a suitably, suitably qualified member can enforce fiduciary duties. And you know, that indeed may well be the answer, but it does sit uneasily with the long-standing and fundamental principles of company law about the distinction between the company and its members, um, and you know, arguably, if one's taking a very technical approach, the objects are the of a charitable company are equivalent to the interests of the members of a private company. And it seems to me it is uncertain whether a court hearing the, the live issue um, would necessarily agree with Lady Arden if, if for example, a claim under the Companies Act was challenged on the basis that a, a person a person interested within section 1151 um, was purporting to bring the claim in respect of a charitable company uh, and hadn't got permission to bring a derivative claim. So those are just two, two points um, that have given me cause to reflect on some potentially difficult issues that have not yet been decided. And I don't know if uh, my fellow panelists have any questions for me. I have a question, Josh, if I may. Thank you, Mrs. Um, could you explain, I'm mean, bear, bearing in mind that uh, power of amendment uh, can arise in many different ways, statutory or by an express provision in the governing document of a charity. Um, how is a power of amendment affected by the structure or form of a charity? Yes, well, um, it is surprising that there are some surprising uh, anomalies in this area too. Um, for a company, the general position is that there's a fairly limited entitlement to, to disclose, to, uh, well, there are rules relating to amendments um, enshrined in statute for companies. Um, there is a, 
a broad consistency between companies limited by guarantees and CIOs. Um, in, in those cases, regulated alter relations need prior permission from the commission. Uh, for unincorporated associations, um, if they're small charities with incomes under 10,000 a year, uh, they can use the section 275 procedure in the Charities Act 2011 to amend their objects without permission. Um, but failing that for an unincorporated charity or indeed a trust in the strict sense, uh, you'd need a CPRA scheme. Um, one very odd, in my view, um, anomaly is that community benefit societies seem to have a, a completely different requirement. Um, under the Cooperative and Community Benefit Societies Act um, of 2014, they're incorporated bodies regulated by that act. And the act requires them to have rules, including provisions about the making uh, the, the method of making amendments or rescinding rules. And section 16 of, of that act requires the amendment to be registered with the FCA. And the FCA must register it if it's not contrary to the other provisions of the act. And in my view, the only relevant provision of the Charities Act is section 197, which prevents the alteration of of the charity's governing document or indeed objects that has the effect of the body ceasing to be a charity. Um, and that provision means that it won't affect the existing assets of the charity. Um, and really the, the effect of the Community Benefit Society legislation is that the trustees can alter the purposes without any kind of permission uh, as long as they remain charitable. So certainly if, if, if the people setting up a charity want to have maximum flexibility for the future and they have uh, purposes that are compatible with the community benefit society regime, then that is certainly a, um, a useful tool for them. Thank you. Josh, I've been thinking about uh, members' rights to information. Does that vary between the different structures that you've been thinking about? Well, it appears so. Um, again, the company position is, is very um, clearly regulated by statute. Um, table A denies the member's right to inspect accounting records or other books or documents of the company without the statutory um, entitlement to do so. And there are limited rights in the Companies Act in respect of the membership list, um, accounts and, and registers of charges. Um, and of course, there is provision in Table A for authorization by the directors. And of course, there's always the possibility of a special resolution. Um, in respect of unincorporated associations, in a case that I was dealing with recently um, about a non-charitable unincorporated association, I came across quite a robust decision um, called Norbrook and Carr, Norbrook, Norbert Laboratories and Carr, which said that effectively the committee hold all the documents of, for the members as agents for the members, any documents that came into uh, existence or they received in the management of the association. So effectively the members had an almost untrammeled right to see um, documents. Um, it's not in absolutely clear the extent to which that reasoning would apply to a charity because of course the committee are acting for the objects not the members but you could certainly say as regards the management of the charity it's the members interests that um, you know, are relevant 
and they may well have that similar um, very, very wide uh, entitlement to, to disclosure subject to um, any kind of limitation in the, uh, the Constitution. Um, another point worth noting is that there appears to be an equitable duty for the directors of a company to give members sufficient information for them to make informed decisions about proposals to be put to them. That's set out in RE-RAC Motoring Services Limited, um, a 2000 decision of, I think it's um, Mr. Justice Newberger. So that duty, again, ties back into the question of members as fiduciaries. They must have a right to, the, um, to enough information to, able, to be able to exercise their their powers appropriately in, in the context of their fiduciary duties. Thank you. So I will now hand over to Natalie. <laughs> so I'm covering the uh, litigation element from the title of our talk. Um, and I'm going to focus on how decisions of the Charity Commission uh, can be challenged either by a charity or by somebody else who's affected by a particular decision. Um, because it's inevitable and unfortunate that no matter how capable and transparent a regulator is, uh, not everybody will agree with the decisions that it makes uh, all of the time. Um, I think as charity lawyers, we're probably all fairly familiar with the tribunal and its jurisdiction. Um, so I'm going to spend my 15 minutes talking about something uh, a little bit different, uh, because the tribunal is not the only way to scrutinise and challenge decisions that are made by the Commission. And there are some decisions of the Commission that either can't be reviewed in the tribunal or can't be appealed to the tribunal. Uh, and so that thing that's a little bit different that I'm going to talk about is uh, the mechanism of judicial review. Um, so it rather begs the question then of which decisions of the Commission can be judicially reviewed in the first place. Um, as charity lawyers, we're probably all familiar with uh, Schedule 6 to the 2011 Act. Uh, and that's where we find a list of decisions or things that can either be appealed to uh, or reviewed in the tribunal. Um, and if you want to challenge your dec a decision or something else that isn't on that list, you're going to have to look elsewhere for the jurisdiction uh, and the forum in which to do that. And the commission, being a public body, is susceptible to judicial review, as all public bodies are. Um, now, I completely accept that Schedule 6 is quite uh, comprehensive and quite widely drawn. Um, but there are some things you might come across uh, that you want to challenge and that actually don't appear on that list. Uh, and one really good example of that is perhaps commission guidance. Uh, and that's also partly how the Independent Schools Council case uh, started life. Um, and another example that I've come across uh, in practice quite recently uh, is de challenging decisions under section 337 subsection 4 of the 2011 Act. And those can only be challenged by way of judicial review. Um, so 337 subsection 4 is the provision that enables the Commission uh, to discharge uh, an earlier order that it's made if it feels that that order was made either by mistake uh, or as a result uh, of a misrepresentation. And if you want to challenge the discharging order that's made under 337 sub 4, you have to do that by way of judicial review. That doesn't appear on the list uh, at Schedule 6. Um, so your starting point for JRs uh, is Schedule 6, and if the decision or the thing that you want to challenge uh, isn't there, you then have to look to the admin court and a JR, rather than looking to uh, an appeal or, or a review in the tribunal. Um, it's all very well to say that you can JR some decisions of the Charity Commission, um, but what would a successful JR get you by way of a remedy? Um, so that's dealt with in Section 31 of the Senior Courts Act 1981. And actually that's your go-to section for JR more generally, it sets out a lot of the framework uh, and a lot of the things that you do need to know. Uh, and section 31 subsection one sets out that the uh, available remedies are mandatory, prohibitory or quashing orders. Uh, and those are given effect to uh, by way of a declaration or an injunction. Um, now, when you consider it's probably going to be a decision of the commission that you are challenging, it might be guidance, but it's probably going to be a decision uh, probably the most uh, appropriate remedy to be seeking would be a quashing order uh, and then remitting the matter back to the Commission to take the decision again if the Commission was uh, so inclined to do so. Um, it's actually quite important to remember if you are JRing a decision of the Commission, the court doesn't have the power to substitute its own decision for that of the Commission. 
uh, that remedy is only available uh, if you are challenging the decision uh, of a court or a tribunal, uh, and that's provided for in section 31, uh, subsection 5 and 5A of the 1981 Act, and obviously the Commission doesn't fall into that category. Um, so once you've established that the thing that you want to challenge is challengeable by way of JR, and you've established that actually the remedy that you're seeking is available under section 31, the next question that you have to ask yourself is, well, what's wrong with this decision or what's wrong with this guidance? Uh, so which grounds of judicial review might apply here, if any? Um, and sometimes it can be very easy to think that something doesn't feel right or something doesn't smell right. Uh, but it can be a lot harder to place an actual legal reason on why it's not right and actually formulate and make out your grounds uh, for a judicial, uh, judicial review. Um, now, I'm not a public lawyer, and I don't think that many charity lawyers are public lawyers. Um, so in a way, unless you've got a really obvious case in front of you and there's a really obvious error like the public body uh, exceeding the scope of a very well-defined and expressed power, actually formulating the grounds for your JR could be uh, the hardest part of your claim. Um, that said though, if you have ever taken a reviewable matter to the tribunal, uh, you probably would have come across section 321 of the 2011 Act, uh, which provides that actually the tribunal must apply the same principles that the High Court would apply if the, if the decision was being JR'd. Uh, so actually, if you have done reviewable matters in the tribunal, some of the grounds for JR could be quite familiar and might not be uh, such a shock to you. Um, so what are the grounds for JR? Well, the, uh, the public lawyers tell me that actually the old formulaic law dip pop criteria are unfashionable, as they put it. Um, but I think you can probably still break down your grounds for challenge into four broad categories. Uh, so you might be looking for a challenge on the grounds of illegality, uh, irrationality, procedural unfairness, or a breach of legitimate expectation. Um, breaking those down further as to what's included uh, and especially things that might be particularly relevant in the charity context. Um, thinking about the head of illegality, you might have an ultra virus challenge. Uh, so you might try and say that actually the public body, in this case, it would be the commission, has acted outside the scope of its powers. Uh, and so for example, that might be particularly relevant if you were uh, challenging a discharging order under section 337, subsection four, because you can only discharge an order that was made by mistake or as a result of a misrepresentation, you might want to try and say that actually the order that's being discharged was not itself made by mistake or misrepresentation, and therefore the commission's exceeding the scope of its powers in making that discharging order. Uh, so that's one example, one concrete example that I've definitely come across. Um, another option might be to look at procedural fairness and whether there was actually a duty to consult before the commission took a particular decision or issued a particular piece of guidance. Um, there may be instances in which there is uh, an express statutory duty to consult, uh, but actually probably what you're more likely to be looking for uh, is a common law duty of consultation. And usually those common law duties arise uh, if there is a party who has uh, an interest that's sufficient uh, to generate an expectation of consultation, or there's been an established practice of consultation. Uh, so if you can meet either of those criteria, there's a good chance that actually there's a common law duty to consult. Um, if a duty to consult does arise, there's also then quite strict guidance in the case law as to what amounts to a uh, sufficient consultation. Uh, the case to look at is a case uh, called Mosley in the Supreme Court in 2014. Um, and broadly what you're looking for is consultation early in that decision making process. Uh, the Commission would have to give enough information uh, that the charity or the person who's to be affected can sensibly respond to that consultation they have to be given adequate time to respond. Uh, and also then the commission would have to take into account conscientiously any product of that consultation. Um, a third example of the grounds of JR that you might be looking at in the charity context, um, thinking about irrationality, you might just be looking at a good old fashioned uh, Wensbury reasonableness challenge, uh, or perhaps in the context of charity law, um, where you've got quite specific public interest considerations at play you might be able to argue in some cases that either irrelevant matters have been taken into account in the decision-making process, or on the flip side, there's been a failure to take into account something that is relevant. Um, so those are just three examples as an introduction or suggestion of the grounds that you might be looking out for if you do ever find yourself in a situation uh, with a client who's thinking about the JR. Um, so that's 
the substance of a JR. Unfortunately, the really difficult bit about a JR, if you're not familiar with them, can actually be the procedure. Um, so the procedure and the practicalities of a JR can be an absolute minefield. There are lots of very short time limits that you need to comply with. And there are lots of formal requirements that just aren't replicated across civil litigation more generally. Um, and so your go-to body of rules that will guide you through a JR if you have one uh, is in part 54 of the CPR and practice direction 54A. Um, and the first thing to say is actually, if you are bringing a JR, what you're doing when you issue a claim is you're asking for permission to bring that claim. It's not like ordinary civil litigation where you can just issue it and then you're off on your way. You actually have to get permission for the claim to continue beyond the preliminary stages. Um, if you are going to issue as well, you have to really keep an eye on your time limits because you must issue either promptly or in any event within three months from the grounds of the claim first arising. And that's actually a really quite a short time limit. So you do have to get your skates on and really assess the claim and get all your drafting done and issued in really good in good time. Um, in terms of what you're issuing then, so JR is uh, governed by modified uh, part eight procedure and it's modified, as I said, by um, part 54 and um, practice direction 54A. It's got its own special kind of claim form. It's an M461 claim form. Uh, and what you do is you assemble yourself a claim bundle into which you put your claim form, your statement of facts and grounds, your evidence, uh, any documents, uh, upon which you want to rely and also you have to include the statutory authority upon which you uh, would like to rely. Now your statement of facts and grounds is the, probably the most important document other than the claim form um, because really that's your pleading and that's where you're going to set out your case. Now uh, a statement of facts and grounds is a lot more discursive uh, than a part seven particulars of claim and it's a proper piece of written advocacy with all the argument and there's been some quite strong guidance from the Court of Appeal in recent years uh, and complaint saying that actually these documents aren't clear enough, they're not setting out with you know, proper accuracy and proper particular, properly particularising what the complaint actually is, which grounds are applying uh, and why. Uh, and so if you do find yourself drafting one of these, that might be something just to keep an eye on because the Court of Appeal have got very strong views on what is and is not acceptable anymore. Um, once you have issued and served your claim, the defendant, so in our hypothetical case, the Commission, would have uh, 21 days to acknowledge service and then serve a summary grounds of defence. Um, so with a JR, you're not going to get their defence straight away. You're going to get a potted version, an indication of what they will argue. It's then the claim bundle, the summary grounds of defence, and any reply that you've chosen to put in as the claimant that will go before a High Court judge. And the High Court judge will determine whether your claim can continue, and they'll do that on the papers. Very rarely is there an oral hearing at that stage. Uh, if you're lucky and you get permission on all of your grounds, uh, you will probably get an order that then also gives you directions uh, through to your final hearing. Uh, if you are really unlucky, you might get permission on no grounds or you might start, fall somewhere uh, in between. If there are some grounds upon which you don't get permission, uh, but you think that you really ought to have got permission, uh, you can put in a, a renewal notice. And that's a very short time limit. That's a seven day time limit. So you have to be quite on the ball with those. Uh, and if you put in your renewal notice, uh, you go to an oral hearing where effectively you ask for permission again on the grounds that were refused. Um, there are two options for that uh, oral hearing. Uh, if you were refused permission on all your grounds, your permission hearing will probably take place at the start of the judge's list one day. It's a half an hour listing at 10 o'clock uh, and you essentially ask for permission again and you might also deal with any uh, cost cap orders um, or cost cap applications, sorry. The second option, if you've already got permissions on some other grounds and there's just one or two floating around that you, you, you're asking uh, to be looked at again, uh, you might have a rolled up hearing. So you'd effectively turn up to the substantive hearing, you'd have a little commission aspect at the start, and then you'd go on to argue the whole claim. So you kind of get a free go. Really. You get to argue the substantive claim in the ground that was actually refused. Um, so those are two options. Um, so having embarked upon one of these for myself, I thought uh, I would give my three top tips uh, for what to do if you do end up with a charity JR uh, and how to get it off the ground. Um, the first one, unfortunately, is a really uh, boring and mundane tip, uh, but it really is just keep an eye on the time limits. 
you do only have three months to issue and that's a long stop. You should be doing it promptly and in any event within three months. Um, and crucially, the parties can't agree to an extension. So it's not like normal civil litigation where you can just agree between yourselves for an extra 28 days. Um, you can't do that. The court can grant an extension, but the parties can't agree one. Um, and I think three months can actually be a pretty tight time limit at the best of times. But if you think about it in the context of a charity, if you've got a decision-making structure that requires a formal decision-making process before you can instruct counsel and solicitors, you can see how this three months will easily be eaten up and you could find yourself quite short on time. Uh, the second tip that I would have uh, is that if you do find yourself with some spare time in your three month time limit, which is probably unlikely, but if you do, uh, you might want to consider uh, some alternative forms uh, of review. Uh, so the commission in its operational guidance uh, makes has quite a lot of provision for uh, a decision review mechanism. Um, so you might want to think about asking the commission just to have a look at their own decision again if you don't agree with it before actually issuing formal proceedings. Um, the problem with that is that you have to do that within three months as well, um, not leaving you with much time with these three month overlapping periods. Um, so unless you're going to get a review from the commission pretty quickly, you're going to find yourself out of time for your JR. So actually this alternative method of uh, commission decision review process is probably an alternative to JR. You probably can't do both. You'd have to make a decision for one or the other. Uh, and my third tip is that if you are doing a JR, you might want to think about whether your clients can apply for a, judi uh, uh, a judicial review cost capping order. Um, so these are provided for in the Criminal Justice and Courts Act 2015. Um, so they're found at sections 88 to uh, 89. And these really evolved uh, from the protective cost order regime. Um, now they're available for, um, quote, public interest proceedings. Uh, and you can apply for one if the claim would be withdrawn if a cost cap wasn't made and it would be reasonable with, to withdraw absent there being a cost cap. Um, so the statute sets out what it considers public interest proceedings uh, will are, and it also sets out the factors to which the court must have regard when it's considering making a cost cap order uh, and the terms uh, in, when, in which any order may be made. Um, cost cap have to be reciprocal. Um, but they don't have to be set at a equal level for each party. Uh, so as you might expect, the claimant's uh, level of liability is usually capped much lower than the defendant public body's liability. Um, and unlike other cost cap regimes, so say for example, the Arbus regime in environment claims, uh, there's no set cap within the statute. Um, so when you put in your application for a cost cap, you might want to, well, you will, probably benefit if you can suggest a cap that might be appropriate. You might look at some of the other regimes and take inspiration. So for example, to use the Aarhus regime, you might suggest 5,000 pounds for the claimant, 35,000 pounds for the defendant public body. Um, in terms of when to make such an application, um, the cost cap can't be granted unless permission for the JR has been given. So you either want to put in your cost cap application when you put in your application for permission or perhaps wait until you've got your grant of permission and then put it in straight away. And if you're putting in a renewal notice or on any refused grounds, that might be a good time to put it in uh, as well. Um, so that is broadly what I was hoping to say. And I realize you might be thinking, well, that's all well and good, but we don't see many of these JRs. Um, that's true, and I do completely accept that. But having done one myself, I can assure you that three months is a very short time in which to get your head around a very complicated procedural regime. And also being a chancery lawyer, some different concepts that I, wasn't, I hadn't really encountered since law school. Um, so if there's any little bit of a head start that you can have, should you find yourself with a JR, then um, hopefully I've given you, given you some ideas. Um, and in any event, as I've already mentioned, if you're going to take a reviewable matter to the tribunal, the tribunal has to apply the same principles that the High Court would apply if you were JRing. Um, so hopefully in terms of substance, there might have been something that's useful, even if the procedure uh, in the tribunal uh, would be completely different. Um, I wonder if there's any questions from the panel. I have a question which is, given the uh, procedural complexities that you've stressed, 
should a charity judicial review be run by a public lawyer rather than a charity lawyer? Yeah, so that is something that troubled me um, when I took on the JR. Um, but actually, the procedure, whilst it is very complicated, is very comprehensively set out in Part 54, in Practice Direction 54A. Uh, and as long as you spend a good amount of time uh, working through that procedure, working out what it is, and especially your time limits, and keeping an eye on what might be coming up in the future, um, not waiting for an order to come in and then think, oh my goodness, I've only got seven days and I've just used three of it. Um, I think in terms of procedure, you can get by. Um, and I think when you start delving into the grounds of JR, you do also have a little worry that actually the identity of the defendant doesn't really make a huge difference. It could be the commissioner, it could be any public body, but actually the core concepts and the grounds, uh, they're always the same, they don't change. Uh, and you might think that actually, yes, public lawyers might be uh, in a stronger position to deal with those concepts, certainly as compared to perhaps chancery and charity lawyers. Um, but I think it's important to remember, as with all of these things, those concepts, they, they don't operate in a vacuum. Um, and you have to be able to understand the, or you have to be able to understand the context uh, in which they apply. And I think if you're a pure public lawyer who doesn't really have any understanding or, or a good understanding of the legal framework that governs charities and also the structure of the charities themselves and their decision making processes and how they might be affected by commission decisions, I think if you don't really understand that, you might actually find it quite difficult to effectively run uh, a JR in the charity context. Um, so whilst I think the pure public lawyers are absolutely best placed to do a JR where they're challenging you know, local authority decision making, I think when it comes to charity law, actually the charity lawyers uh, do have a lot more to offer and provided that we can get our minds around the public law procedure, I think we're perfectly placed to do them. I have a question, if I may, Natalie. Um, I, I, I should mention that I have been involved in a, um, advising on something which could either turn out to be a JR or charity proceedings um, involving the, um, a medical organization and um, the exciting topic of um, assisted dying. Um, but, um, would you would you say it, in that in that case actually it's working out quite nicely because I'm advising on the charity law aspects and um, a public law is advising on the JR aspects and we are learning from each other as we go along. But um, would you think it's worthwhile as a charity lawyer becoming familiar with JR and uh, the principles so that you're ready to um, to use JR when it's appropriate. Uh, and do you think that there, should, there should be more JRs in in relation to charities? Because um, it's not only um, decisions of the Charity Commission, but sometimes the decisions of charities themselves. Um, that there should be more of that and less reliance on the tribunal. So I think in response to the first part of the question, uh, Yes, it would be beneficial if we had uh, a base level of understanding ready to go, uh, should we need it. Uh, and also sometimes just to spot that it's an option. It might be that we always just default to thinking, you know, this belongs in the tribunal or this belongs in the chancery division, but actually there might be another angle to explore. And JR might be the more appropriate uh, way to bring a claim. Um, uh, in response to the second part of the question, and should the tribunal uh, ca carry, to, carry on being the default place? Um, I think it is right that the tribunal retains as much jurisdiction uh, as it does, um, and that Schedule 6 is actually quite widely drawn. Um, whilst the admin court judges are you know, absolutely and undoubtedly excellent, I think it is important that if you're practicing in a specialist area of law, uh, you do have a similarly specialist tribunal, uh, at least in the first instance, because then at least you can think that actually maybe this dispute might be resolved in a more efficient manner. You might think, well, actually, I'm going to have a judge that really understands these issues uh, and can really drill down into them and identify what needs resolving here. Um, yeah. And that's not unusual. There are other very specialist uh, courts. So, for example, there's an entire planning court. Um, OK, fine, it's, it's uh, a limb of the admin court, but nonetheless, it exists and it has specialist judges that just sit there. Um, and I think actually as well with charities, the really important thing to remember is that this is all public money. 
and charitable funds. Um, so anything that we can do to ensure that this uh, decision making process or all this and this method of challenge uh, is efficient as possible should always be welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's that's helpful. So I see there are some unanswered questions in the chat box. Um, in respect of of unincorporated charities, amendments to objects might not require a CPRA scheme where the governing documents include an express power to amend any provision of the governing documents, albeit rarely seen in practice, this is potentially possible. Would you agree? Well, broadly, yes. Um, I think the Commission's position certainly is that they take a relatively hands-off approach with those types of um, provisions if you're lucky enough to have one in a registered unincorporated charity um, it would have to be pretty clear that it applied to everything but it provided you were um, still a charity at the end of it it should be possible to amend using that express power to amend the objects using the express power. I think there's one in the box uh, for me. Um, so my question is, uh, would a charity need to apply for Beddo relief before uh, bringing a claim for judicial review? Um, I think touching on something that Josh was talking about uh, in terms of um, charity proceedings, um, you don't need permission uh, to bring a JR because that doesn't fall under section 115, it's not charity proceedings. Uh, and in any event, if you're a charity bringing a JR, you are probably going to be bringing it against the commission. And so it would seem odd to be asking uh, the commission for permission uh, to JR them. Um, so applying that by analogy to Bedo relief, I think you're probably okay to pursue a JR application or permission for a JR application um, without applying for Bedo relief. Um, obviously, you'd always have to have regard to the, the governing document of the charity and what the powers of the trustees are, uh, and also just you know, regard to the general circumstance and any legal advice that you have on the merits of the claim. Um, but ultimately, that's part of the uh, benefit of the JR procedure in that you have to get permission to bring your claim, because if your claim is hopeless, you would hope that it would get knocked out at permission stage before there are too many costs and too many bad consequences of what you're doing. Um, so in short, I think the answer is probably no, you don't need to make an application unless there's something very specific going on in your circumstance uh, that leads you to believe that it might be prudent. Time has come for me to say thank you to everyone for, for joining in. And we're very delighted at the numbers who, who um, took the trouble to, to Zoom. And um, we hope we've stimulated some thought, have fun with the, your JRs and your um, amendments to constitutions and um, hope, hope to be in touch with people generally in, in the future. Thank you very much again.